Discord is a social platform that's a bit like a Facebook or Twitterish social network, but oriented around real-time chat and voice communication, rather than focusing on posts and timelines. It was built by folks who had worked in the video game industry, and the core concept shaping Discord was to allow people playing online games to chat with each other and develop strategies and figure out puzzles, or just casually banter while competing with other teams, fighting a difficult boss, or whatever else in-game. The word Discord was used as a name because it was available as a URL and trademark, but also because the problem the founders were trying to solve was the issue of Discord within in-game communication. Chatting and such was generally limited by the often quite not good built-in options in each and every individual video game. So this network gave gamers a means of typing or talking to each other while playing with the minimum of difficulty or distraction. Shortly after its founding in mid-2015, it also became a place to hang out between gaming sessions and took on a role similar to Reddit in that asynchronous, not just real-time communication was both allowed and encouraged. People used the available chat rooms, like message boards, which centralized that type of conversation around games and related topics in the same application as their instant messaging and in-game chatter. Discord has, in the years since, been built into the infrastructure of video gaming consoles and computer gaming platforms, making it the default omni-communication app for much of the video game world. In 2020, it made a push to diversify beyond gaming as well. The platform had long been used for non-gaming stuff alongside the core gaming content, but it was still branded and predominantly used as a video gaming hub. Just like video game live streaming service Twitch invested in expanding into other sorts of live streams, especially during the virtual everything heavy pandemic, Discord decided around that same time to redesign some aspects of the service to make it more user-friendly for non-gamers, opening up these tools to people who wanted to communicate digitally for any reason, not just gaming-related purposes. Discord was almost scooped up by Microsoft, which among many other things owns the Xbox video gaming brand, but they ultimately ended up staying independent, further investing in that broadening of their audience pivot, much to the dismay of some of their existing video gamer users. Over the years, Discord has dealt with some of the same issues other social platforms have struggled with, despite being distinct from feed-based platforms like Twitter and Facebook. Users have posted copyrighted content, illegal and abusive imagery, and in one case, created bots that would pull content directly from YouTube, filtering out ads in the process. That actually led to a partnership with YouTube, eventually, that resulted in a feature that allowed folks to watch YouTube videos in Discord together. But in general, Discord has dealt with somewhat fewer legal complexities compared to their larger, more mainstream social kin. Almost certainly because they are nowhere near as big as Meta or YouTube, only employing somewhere around 600 people, compared to something like 65 to 70,000 for Meta after a recent huge wave of firings, and a few thousand at YouTube, though of course YouTube is just one component of umbrella company Alphabet, which boasts something like 180,000 employees. So Discord is much beloved by a segment of the online world, is trying to expand to a larger audience, but at this point is smallish and still quite niche, which means it isn't hit by quite as many scandals as its larger social platform competition. But issues do still pop up because of the services it offers, and because of the folks who use it. What I'd like to talk about today is a recent batch of classified document leaks that were initially released on Discord. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're enjoying what I'm doing here, please consider becoming a financial supporter of the show. The simplest way to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things, or you can become a member at understandery.com to support this and all of my projects. 
Folks who become supporters gain access to an additional episode of the show each month and an ad-free version of the show. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support Let's Know Things. You're the reason I'm able to make this show each week, and for that I am truly grateful. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to start with today comes from the Washington Post, and it's entitled Discord Member Details How Documents Leaked from Closed Chat Group. Before I get into the specifics of that story, though, which is still evolving as of the day I'm recording this, so some of the details could change in the coming days, maybe even before you listen to this. But before I get into that, there is another headline from gaming publication Kotaku, published back on June 2nd of 2022, that I would like to share with you. And that headline reads, Another guy has leaked classified military documents on the same Tank Games forums. And the lead paragraph of that story reads, quote, Can you keep a secret? Of course you can. You're an adult. Could you keep military secrets? If threatened with prison or worse for revealing them, I bet you could. So why in God's name do people playing the tank video game War Thunder of all things keep leaking classified military documents? End quote. War Thunder is a free-to-play, massively multiplayer online game that's been out since 2012, but changed its name from World of Planes to War Thunder in 2013. It's available on pretty much every major gaming platform, and it has won a bunch of awards, and has only seemed to get more popular each year, in part because it's free, in part because it's a free MMO game, which people tend to like, as it allows them to compete with other folks in real time from around the world, and in part because it's a war game that allows folks to control different sorts of actual military hardware, choosing between super casual, point-and-click and shoot arcade-like conditions, and ultra accurate accurate, almost like a training simulator level of realism. Some elements of the game are more realistic than others. Recent add-ons have included a Dune-like game mode with giant sandworms and such, and there's another that allows players to duke it out using giant mech robots. But some portion of the fan base for this game is made up of players who are super into the accuracy element, and who, as it turns out, will go to great lengths to prove their knowledge about the specifics of the portrayed military hardware, in part probably to help the game makers improve the realism of it, but almost certainly also to score online points to earn clout with their fellow gamers. This piece in Kotaku is about a player leaking classified military documents in this game's forum in order to win an argument about the properties and capabilities of a Chinese tungsten penetrator projectile, and this leak followed earlier leaks of classified documentation, also in this game's forum, for France's Leclerc main battle tank and Britain's Challenger 2 main battle tank, both of which were seemingly leaked to win an argument, and both of which led to the content in question being removed but not before it was noted by government officials. While it may seem bizarre for folks who don't spend gobs of time online or in niche internet communities, this sort of behavior, deranged as it might seem from the outside, lines up with folks doing dumb stuff to gain social clout in these and other social spaces. The coin of the realm in the highly realistic simulator-grade facet of this military video game is knowledge and a sort of obsessive geekery about this stuff. So the idea that leaking classified military information is not too bright might never cross the minds of those who do so. They know things. The person they are talking to does not. So they are ultra-focused on correcting the record and making themselves look good and knowledgeable to folks whose opinions they care about. This is relevant to what's become known as the Discord leaks, because the genesis of the leaks seems to be similar to these and other leaks that have shown up on the War Thunder forums over the years. More specifically, looping back around to that piece in the post, it would seem that a 21-year-old Massachusetts Air National Guard serviceman named Jack Teixeira, who was a member of a Discord server, which is kind of like a room on the platform, and in this case a private invite-only room that focused on discussions about hardcore Catholicism, 
guns and military hardware, and a highly, some might even say, extremist conservative position on global events. And he started posting what looked to be government secrets in this chat area, initially without anyone realizing what he was up to. But over the course of months, accumulating followers of mostly teenage boys and young men who started to see him as the guy who knew what was up, and who somehow had his finger on the pulse of what was going on behind closed doors in the upper echelons of decision makers and military leaders around the world. Which, as it turns out, and this is seldom the case, no matter how much people on the internet might claim to know, as it turns out, in this case, he actually did have insight into these things because of his job inside a secure government facility. Teixeira was, from what we know now at least, a 21-year-old who had access to a bunch of classified information, and he was sneaking that information out into the world. Not to sell it to a foreign government or anything like that, at least as far as we know currently, but rather to gain clout with a group of other similar young men who lurked in an online forum that he wanted to impress. Teixeira has been arrested and will be charged under a provision of the Espionage Act, which could result in upward of two decades in prison. He apparently had an IT job that gave him access to these sorts of documents, despite not having clearance to access them in the traditional fashion. And it seems fairly certain at this point that restrictions on who can see and handle what sorts of information will be tightening up in the coming months, though a lot of tightening has already happened in the wake of leaks by also IT guy Edward Snowden, who released documents related to NSA spying back in 2013, the 2010 leak of military documents to WikiLeaks, by soldier and analyst Chelsea Manning, the 2017 Air Force and NSA member Reality Winners leak of a classified document to news publication The Intercept, and the much earlier leak of what became known as the Pentagon Papers by Daniel Ellsberg back in 1971. Ellsberg was an analyst at the RAND Corporation and had access to a report commissioned from RAND by the U.S. military about the Vietnam War. In each of these cases, things the U.S. government didn't want the world to know were unveiled and made available, sometimes after being filtered through journalistic entities, sometimes published directly online, but most such leaks have resulted in embarrassment for the U.S. military and government, as such leaks make their systems look insecure and untrustworthy, and because these leaks often point at bad behavior by elements of the U.S. government apparatus, whether that means lying about how badly the Vietnam War is going, about how elements of the government are illegally spying on citizens, and or about how warfare is conducted, showing some of the brutal realities of that conduct more clearly. In those earlier cases, the leakers in question seem to have done what they did for ideological reasons. They didn't think what was happening was okay and wanted to shine a spotlight on it. They wanted to instigate change, make people aware of what was happening behind closed doors. In this case, again, we don't know this for 100% certain, but early reports suggest Tejera was just online clout chasing, which is in some ways worse for the U.S. military and governmental establishment because it suggests this could represent a long-term issue for them. They cannot just make some changes to the way the NSA operates to plug further leaks of this kind because this type of leaker is doing it to seem smart and cool to their online chums, not because of some sort of ideological conflict. That's not their primary purpose, at least, which means plugging such leaks could be tricky. It means trying to control how people behave in their personal time and how they relate to tribes that they want to be a part of. But whatever the rationale of the leaker, the damage caused by these sorts of divulgences can be substantial, if you're looking at things from the government's perspective at least. Some of this stuff is arguably good for the public to know, but some classified information puts lives at genuine risk and can necessitate large-scale recalibrations and reinvestments by all sorts of entities. For instance, the Discord leaks revealed a lot of unvarnished takes on Russia's invasion of Ukraine from the perspective of U.S. officials. And those takes, at times, contrast with the optimistic rosy picture painted by their public statements. It was divulged that the U.S. higher-ups are concerned about Ukraine's near-future prospects, alongside a bunch of practical information about why. Insufficient artillery shells and ammo, a vulnerability to airstrikes, things like that. 
And those sorts of data points, combined with information on Ukraine's supposedly impending offensive strategies, means the Ukraine military may have to completely change their plan of attack and maybe rapidly shore up weak spots that were just pointed out to their Russian opposition. These leaks also showed that the U.S. intelligence community has infiltrated the Russian military pretty high up in the chain, which gives Russia a chance to figure out who is feeding this information to U.S. assets. It also showed that seeming bystander nations like Egypt have possibly engaged in negotiations to supply military equipment to Russia, and that Turkey, which is part of NATO, may have been approached by the Russian-controlled mercenary group Wagner to provide supplies for their war effort. We also learned that some of the U.S.'s allies are only very uncomfortably kind of sort of aligning themselves with Ukraine, and that Israel's spy service, Mossad, may have pushed to get Israeli citizens out in the streets to protest recent judicial reforms in the country, which also implicitly indicates the U.S. has high-level sources within Mossad. None of this, I should note, is 100% certain. U.S. officials have confirmed that these documents seem to be legitimate, but classified documents can have errors and biases baked into them, and some of the numbers presented, including the estimated number of Russian soldiers killed during the invasion of Ukraine so far, have been questioned, as they're wildly out of proportion with other estimates, indicating that they could be wrong or they could have been edited at some point along the way, possibly after the original documents and info were dumped onto Discord, but before they were noticed. There were months between these things being divulged by Teixeira on Discord, and they're showing up on the government's radar. And in between, they were copied onto a bunch of other Discord servers, onto other social networks, and by all sorts of people, including, in one case, being dumped onto a Minecraft-focused chat room. Also worth noting here is that there have been reports of Russian agents targeting gamers, especially war game gamers, on platforms like Discord, to try to get them to divulge more information of this kind. You could imagine them basically challenging the intelligence and knowledge of gamers, trying to prod them into anger and embarrassment so that they share information to which they have access through their job, and then scooping up whatever is provided by people that they know work at military facilities, using it to build out their assessment of the U.S.'s intelligence capabilities and so on, playing on the insecurities of 21-year-olds on these networks where they hang out to catalyze more leaks, basically. As of the day I'm recording this, there's been no public indication that that is what has happened in this instance, but this strategy has been in the ether for a while now, and there's a chance it played a role here, or it could play a role in future divulgences of this kind. Also worth noting is that the U.S. military has been using the Discord groups for military-themed games for recruiting as well. They're not so keen on the leaks, but they have been scrambling to increase sign-ups, and they've noticed that folks in these spaces with these types of interests tend to be more likely to sign on than the average person on the street. So it kind of makes sense that other nations might notice the same and decide to see what value they can wring out of this corner of the online gaming community. A few other quick points. First, some of the talking heads on Fox News and similar mostly conservative networks have celebrated this leak, and that's led to calls to basically stop playing Fox News on public TVs at military bases, because it could be that other soldiers go on to leak more information to which they have access, and that would not be good for the United States, but it would be good for Russia and similar antagonists. And they might do this because they were told it was good and cool and a patriotic thing to do by this and similar networks. Second, is that some commentators are saying this could have been much worse, and that the documents shared, seemingly by pure happenstance, were not that big a deal, and likely mostly just confirmed suspicions and estimates and data already possessed by the entities we wouldn't want to get their hands on secret documents. And that might be just a lucky break, but it could also imply that this is some kind of false flag or tricky intentional divulgence by the U.S. and allied entities meant to look uncomfortable and accidental in order to lure Russia into a false sense of security, leading up to some kind of major war-ending attack by Ukraine. That latter possibility is incredibly unlikely, and almost certainly this leak is exactly what it seems to be, and just happened to not be as bad as it could have been. 
Even President Biden played down its importance, and U.S. presidents almost always amplify the perceived importance of leaks because it allows them to come down harder on leakers and lock things down more assiduously in the aftermath. So that's interesting too. But it's worth noting that this is a narrative floating around in the ether, even if it is an unlikely narrative. And third, these leaked documents serve as a reminder that the U.S. government is spying on pretty much everyone all the time and as much as they possibly can. And that's true of every country to the best of their ability, but the U.S. is uniquely positioned because of its power and wealth and influence to get all up in everyone else's business. And though the shamblingly awkward and amateurish nature of some bungled government efforts gets most of the press, it's worth remembering that there is a huge intelligence apparatus underpinning essentially everything the U.S. government does. And that means they are infiltrating everyone and everything and everywhere, including their allies. And because of this, any leak has the potential to be just absolutely gargantuan and damaging, even those that initially seem to be not too harmful. So there is a chance that this one, as we learn more and the documents are more thoroughly collected and analyzed, could scale up in perceived importance as well, alongside the possible scaling up of the regularity of this type of leak predicated on clout-seeking rather than ideology in the coming years, as our digital relationships and tribes become even more central to our happiness and sense of social belonging. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter. The simplest way to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. You can also become a member at understandry.com, or you can make use of one of the other options at let's know things.com slash support. A great big thanks to everyone who's already helping to support this show, and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. The book I'd like to recommend today is called Rule of the Robots, How Artificial Intelligence Will Transform Everything by Martin Ford. I read this book at a somewhat interesting time. It was right before all of the recent hubbub, most of which is predicated on large language models, but not exclusively, and all of the chat GPTs and the Dolly 2s and all of the Google Bard and other alternatives were all released at a rapid fire cadence. Everyone trying to outmaneuver everybody else and all of these new options doing really impressive things seemingly out of nowhere. And they weren't really out of nowhere. This stuff has been percolating in the background of technology for a very long time. And that's part of what this book does a good job of addressing. It points at where AI is already seeping into essentially all of our technologies and then talks about some of the areas in which this new empowered type of AI, the stuff that's doing increasingly impressive stuff and that seems to have scaled up really rapidly, which aspects of life and industry and which professions will probably see the biggest changes in the relatively near future. It's a pretty good overview of the concept of AI and what we're talking about when we say AI in the modern contemporary meaning anyway, and it does provide a good sense of some places to be watching as you're reading the news and trying to understand where all of this might go next. If any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of Rule of the Robots by Martin Ford. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcript for this and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find my other news-focused podcast, One Sentence News, wherever you get your podcasts or at onesentencenews.com. And feel free to reach out and say howdy on social media. I'm at Colin is my name on Twitter and Instagram and Colin Wright on Facebook and YouTube and quite a few other ones. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright and I'll talk to you again next week. Mm -hmm.